This week on the Baseball Together podcast, we have a sticky ejection, some All-Star Game jerseys, and our Cubs, Mount Rushmore's, right now. Nine Plus Us presents the Baseball Together podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Kansas City Little Big Briggy Blue Eyes, and now, Baseball Together. Welcome to this week's episode of the Baseball Together podcast, Baseball Family. I am Brad, and as always, to my right, we have our man... We have Brig. Hi. <laughs> I'm here. Hi there. Okay. Hi there. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's get into this, Brig, because we got a lot going on. Uh, we got a lot to talk about today. Um, had an eventful weekend. Uh, first things first, you know, Brig, I'll be honest with you. I didn't want to talk about foreign substances today. I know. Um, I, I don't think you did either because Mostly we've been was- talking about it. I was teasing you, but yes. no, I know. But but really, though, legitimately, I didn't want to. I was looking forward to not talking forward forward uh, foreign substances today, right? Until yesterday, um, I was watching the Mariners game. And we had Hector Santiago get ejected for having foreign substances on his arm and glove. I was like, oh my gosh, that's crazy! And I was kind of overreacting, saying, "Geez, DFA that guy when he comes back. He's not that good anyway." As my as my high school coach would say, "He's not that damn good anyway. I don't need him." <laughs> so that's kind of the attitude I had. Yeah, but yeah. as it turns out, uh, he I mean, he had a legitimate look of surprise on his face, as did Scott Service. Scott Service got ejected as well because he's arguing with the umpire about the fact that Hector Santiago just had rosin. Rosin on his glove. Yep. Now, riddle me this, Rob. <laughs> You've outlawed everything. Everything for pitchers. Except for rosin. And, you know, we did have, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, Trevor Bauer demonstrated the sticky nature of rosin and sweat. Yep. And that's all Santiago had. He had rosin and sweat. And Scott Service even said after the game, he's like, he had rosin all over himself because he didn't want sweat to drip down into his glove or down into his hand. So he's basically using it as a barrier down his arm to keep sweat from dripping down his, down to his hands, which I thought was legal. Did you think that was legal? Yeah. I don't. It sure seemed like it was for. legal. You know, that's exactly but what now, it's for. <laughs> yeah. Now I don't know. I don't know what the rules are, and no, I don't know I... if anybody knows what the rules are. And and the issue that I have with this is that now you're you've got this massive gray area for pitchers, right? Yeah. Like you can use rosin, but you can't use too much of it. Right. No, that's sticky. so. Then that's what's a the sticky line? Thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, man. I I was more irritated about the fact that it's like that they're cracking down so far that they're not letting these guys use rosin the way that it's naturally meant to be used. Yeah. Well, and especially because it was explicitly stated that that's all you could use. Yes. Yes, and you know, <laughs> you see you see guys getting ready in the bullpen and they they rosin up both arms in yeah. the bullpen. Yeah. All the time. All the time. You see a first baseman, a shortstop, second baseman, third third baseman coming over to the mound and rosining up their arms themselves on a hot day when they get sweaty. That's right. That's exactly right. And so, in that documentary about the pitcher in Chicago, they used it for the hidden ball trick. So, it's very useful. They did. It is very useful at Rosenbag. Yeah. <laughs> He's by Rosenbagger himself. But... Right. <laughs> but... Oh man, that was really but really well though, like. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> but yes. so they took his glove and they put it in a trash bag and sent it off to New York. Yeah. And honestly, Brig, if they don't come back and be like, "Oh, honest mistake, you're not suspended for ten games," um, Seattle can have you back. Because at this point, like like I said, Santiago, he's, he hasn't been like a massive piece to that bullpen. Right. But he's a warm body. And at this point, like we need warm bodies in Seattle. Let's yeah. be real. That bullpen has had some issues. And, and the fact they can't replace him with another warm body, that's an issue. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a serious problem. But Golly. what he's become, now he's catapulted into the status of a figurehead, right? Now we have uh-huh. – we have uh, – not just a warm body, but we have someone iconic, semi-iconic at this point. You know, he's the mm-hmm. first victim of this new rule, and he might become influential. So hopefully he takes his time off to, like, improve his craft a little bit or something so that when he comes back, hopefully vindicated, his performance is better. That'd be 
that'd be poetic justice and would be awesome. That would be really nice, you know? Well, and here's the other thing, too, is that this is the other thing that really ticked me off about this, was that just two days before he had pitched against the Rockies. Yeah. Sorry, I guess I guess it was like two or three days before. Anyways, earlier in that week, he had pitched against the Rockies and passed his inspection. Right, right. And I'm assuming he hadn't done anything different. Sure. Cooler temperatures I mean, <laughs> that day, maybe, with the only difference. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but, but at the same time, it's like we talked about before, though. Pitchers should be sweating when they're pitching anyway. Yeah. Oh, right. That's a full workup, right? Like you said, if yeah. you're not sweating fully yeah. by the time you get on the mound, something's wrong. Yeah, you're yeah, you need to be need to be working a little bit harder. And pitching is an active and like labor intensive process anyway. A, a guy could be throwing at 55 degrees and he'll be sweating. Yep. 100% if he's throwing hard. So Yes. So I would think that he would still have rosin all over his arm if it's a little bit cooler day in Seattle. Yeah. That's why I rolled his Chapman wears long sleeves almost all the time. Cuz that dude he, mm. that dude leaks like a faucet. He does, yeah, yeah. Seriously, like out of his forehead, he sweats like I do from his forehead. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I don't, I don't sweat in many areas of my body, but man, my forehead is like insane. Yeah, you can see it dripping off the brim of his, the visor of his cap. It's, really, it's really intense. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's very intense. But so let's talk a little bit uh, beyond the suspension. Let's talk a little bit about. Uh, you've got a spin rate tracker on here, Brig. Yeah. So what is this? One week after the crackdown, we've got uh, we've got what Garrett Cole's spin rate is down. Is that right? It's down. Yeah. Right? So so what we're calling them, and this is borrowing a little bit from Sports Illustrated. <coughs> they did a pretty good analysis on this. Excuse me. What ends up happening is that we're calling anything over twenty five hundred RPMs. There, the the guy who wrote the article for Sports Illustrated called it a super uh, spin. And, okay. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, I think that's pretty common, or at least it's intuitive. But anything mm-hmm. over twenty five hundred is is an elite. I mean, top of the line, one hundred percent elite fastball. We're talking mostly four seam fastballs here. But mm-hmm. if you what you what we've learned through the analysis by Sports Illustrated is that fastballs over twenty five hundred RPM are down on average from seventeen point two per game to five point three per game on average so that's again that's four seam fastballs that are thrown per game over 2500 rpm rotations per minute so that's what we're talking about spin rate garrett cole for example in 2019 now that's the year he won the era title right everybody was Mm -hmm. all hot and bothered about garrett cole that year his spin rate was 2530 2530 rpm that's insane. That's it. It's pretty insane, and that's not the top. That's not necessarily the top end of what we've seen, but that is a great average spin rate. Um, mm-hmm. This month alone, okay, and it again, it's only been a week, but <laughs> but if you understand averages and statistics at all, you're gonna love this. This month alone, <laughs> <laughs> his average has gone down to. Um, 2,358 RPM on his four seam fastballs. And his ERA is now 4.65 just this month, just in June. That's significant. Um, oh, and if anybody, if you're curious what a, what a spin rate does on a fastball, so we talked a while ago about the, the documentary Fastball, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And if you have a tremendous spin rate on your four seam fastball, you're going to get what they refer to as ride or what creates the illusion to a hitter and i've seen it yeah it makes it look like the fastball goes up yep and it makes it really 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 hard to hit yeah so that's i mean that's why some of these guys are so hard to hit is because they can get a really good spin rate on that four seam fastball get some ride on it, it makes it look like it's going up and it's it's almost impossible right and again to reference that documentary uh fastball the the best hitters in the world have gone on record saying that they can see the stitching they can see they so they can identify what direction it's moving where it will likely be mm-hmm. placed at whatever point you know i mean this is all happening in a blink of an eye but they're they're doing they're reading the pitch the release point the fingers on the ball and then the stitching the way it's rotating through the air is discernible just enough for them to pick it up and figure out what kind of pitch it might be um, yeah. And then they hedge, yeah. right? They assume at that point they have milliseconds to make the decision 
and they hedge and decide where they're going to swing. But with the sp- faster spin rates, there's no, there's no, dis- you can't discern that, right? There's no way to perceive mm-hmm. even for a fraction of a second what pitch might be coming, and that's why it's so hard to hit. Yep, yep, it's true. It's rough. So we've we've seen that not everybody's spin rate has dropped. No, nope. um, you Darvish. Has not changed. Right. Um, Jacob deGrom has not changed. Not changed and he was not necessarily a significant spin rate guy to begin with. Right. You know, he's he's a he's a control power thrower, which is insane. Yeah. That he's like throwing like throwing gas like Randy Johnson and locating like Greg Maddox. That's what makes him so hard to hit. That's exactly no, that is the perfect <laughs> example. That's a great way to bring it together. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's unfair to watch him pitch. He's like it's like watching a video game when he throws. That's right. Absolutely. It's nuts. just fun. But, but so go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, so that's that's what we have going on with foreign substances. I'm really hoping, Brig, that we don't have to to talk about this next week. I don't want to talk about foreign substances. I, I don't think we'll week. talk about it next week, but I think the week after we will. Well, maybe at the all star break. I doubt we will. But you know, f- man, can you imagine the world where a dude gets ejected from the all star game? <laughs> like what happens? What the freak happens then? <laughs> Rob, just take a break. All right, take just a day take- off. <laughs> <laughs> from inspecting for foreign substances, let the guys throw the ball. Yeah. Jeez. Hey, can I ask? Unreal. Can I ask a question really quick? Yeah. Where is Justin Verlander? <laughs> am I? Am I the only one that's like, wait a minute? This dude was a, uh, an everyday household name, and now, poof, he's gone. <laughs> Yeah, well, and the only thing I've seen of him in a while was today I saw that he's that he hasn't ruled out a uh, a reunion with the Tigers. Well, yeah. That's the only thing I've heard from him pretty much this entire season. That sounds an awful lot like the kid at the candy store who's three cents shy of the lollipop he wants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, please, sir, can I have some more? It's like, that's how that feels. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is terrible to say. And Justin Verlander's terrific. No, I'm not disparaging him at all. But that's just that's kind of funny, um, especially in the wake of what happened to Albert Pujols. It just kind of feels more like, hey, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> like, yeah, you're yep. playing shortstop because, honey, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so, last thing I want to say about foreign substances: this all this change really started to take place, like like a tiny bit in 2017 and then 2018 is when everything started really picking up. Like we saw a little bit in 2015 from like the real egregious violators. People have been doing it for a long time. So, so you can count this. Yeah. Somebody called it goo gate. <laughs> goo gate. <Yeah, laughs> I don't know, but you can, <laughs> this loading up the ball, you can, uh, you can, ca- you can start at about 2015, 2016, and, and go till now. I think is a pretty good time frame uh-huh. if you were, for those of you like me that want to bracket things, and then um, you can see whose spin rates have changed in that period of time. That, mm-hmm. So, for if you want to do some more research, that's that's what the bracket I would put it in. Anyway, we can move on. And and oh, well, and I would I would contribute the change that right there during that time is because that's about the time those rap soto machines are being introduced the what so they had a rap soto machines it's like a like a radar oh. kind of like the uh, the stack yeah, 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 machines yeah. yeah except they're smaller and they're specifically for yeah. pitchers so they can track their spin rate in the yeah. bullpen so guys are getting immediate feedback on there and like wait a mm-hmm. minute let me see if i get that spin rate up and they can do it right there in the yeah. bullpen without having to go you know into the clubhouse and look at the stats for the day so yeah that's cool that's that's really how this whole thing started. For sure. But anyway, we have All-Star Game jerseys. Yeah, we do. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, uh, we do. <laughs> so, so this, they're making this changes here. So every year we've had All-Star, All-Star jerseys. Okay, I'm not going to say All-Star Game jerseys. We just had All-Star jerseys every single year. Right. This year they're actually going to wear them in the yes. game. And I'm really excited about that because I always thought the mismatched jersey thing, like, yeah, they had, like, the white and the gray, whatever, that's fine. But it just, to me, it seemed strange. It made sense when the NBA went to, I guess you could say, uniform uniforms. Right. <laughs> right. right. They had, like, red and blue or yeah. whatever, <laughs> you know. But I always thought it made sense. They have it in the NFL. Why not do it in other sports? Uh, the NBA did it, and MLB is finally doing it. And 
uh, before I share my thoughts, Brig, what do you think of these jerseys? And I'm hundred percent with you, man. I don't, I don't like the mismatch thing. It makes no sense to me. It's always felt incongruous and kind of silly. And and messy. And what? And messy. It's messy. It is messy. And look, everybody wears them for the freaking home run derby, right? We have the American yes. League ones. Yes. We have the National League one, and and it's like, why why would you produce all of these? Yes. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Just for one three-hour event that really only eight yes, guys are going to wear exactly. them for anyway. And then what are you going to sell, merch? Is that the whole point? Which I think it is, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is a big cash grab. That's why they and I just I didn't understand exactly. Everybody's wearing them for the home run derby. Nobody's yeah. wearing them for yeah. the game. That made oh it never made any sense. Well, and to if me. it's a cash grab and everybody's wearing the all star caps because the all star caps have been a big deal forever, and that makes a lot of sense to me, but. Because uh-huh. there is a, an element of uniformity every year with the All Star caps, but there, right. I think yeah. there really needs to be like, no, this is the All Star jersey, like you know. And mm-hmm. anyway, that's how I feel. What do you think? You say, you sounds like you feel the same way. I do. I feel exactly the same way, um, and that's one reason. Like back when I was, I used to be a big jersey collector, and I was always like, man, those are super cool, but why would I buy a batting practice jersey? Right. And, you know, now that I've gotten a little bit older, it's like, okay, I, I have a greater appreciation for batting practice jersey. But that is literally a jersey that is just for practice and not – it was never worn in a game. And so I had no interest in buying an All-Star game jersey. However, I do think it's funny that they've gone from they, – they always wore, up to this point, regular full-button, like, yes. game jerseys, yes. right? And now they're wearing them in the game, but it's a two-button, like, Henley oh, top. And it's like it's a batting practice it. jersey. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh I'm God. so excited about it. I could pee my pants. And I hope I love the- I hope that there isn't that weird like like when you wore your dad's old uh collared shirts, like the button up shirts, because they were you know, you didn't have your own and the the scoops way down in the back and way down the front. <laughs> That's my biggest pet peeve about jerseys is that big flap. Now I got it. I got it. It's for people who are playing baseball, and they're trying to replicate that. Uh But the fans, we don't want all that extra fabric. Now, what are we going to do? Shove it in our pants? Look like, look like, uh, what's his name? David Bowie from the Labyrinth? You know what I mean? Trying to wear your... (laughs) You know what what I always did with those jerseys? I would tuck in the, I would tuck in the front. And then kind of like blouse it sure. over a little bit, and then just like let the yeah. back hang. But it was still almost down to my the back exactly. of my knees. It's stupid, you know. Yeah, I, I don't get it. <laughs> anyway, I hope they don't do that. They probably already did. I don't know, but and and I'm sure they do because they've got to stay tucked yeah. in anyway. But it, if you were to buy a replica, I don't think it would be quite so. Yeah, long. I hope not. I think no, it would I be shorter, not. but. But no, I th- I think they look really good. They look like soccer kits, which I feel like is getting to be more That's and more right. of a trend. Yes. Right, we had the Miami uh, Sugar Kings jerseys looked like look like soccer kits. These look a lot like soccer kits. I think it looks good, and the, and the reason I like those is because they're clean. It's a nice clean look. Has the number, has the has the team logo, and then there's the uniform yep. color. I think it looks yep. great. Uh, I'm not as crazy about the hat because I'm just I don't know why I don't like stars. I don't on hats. either. I don't, I don't either, is. dude. I'm the same way. I didn't know you felt that way. It's so I freaking strange. hate stars on hats. Yeah, I don't Man, know why. I don't either. It doesn't look good. No. And these ones are purple on top of black with then the team colors. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's weird. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's they threw it together. It's kind of been short notice. Got it. Fine. You get a pass. But what I love about the jerseys is that the stripe on the sleeve is the is a is a lighter variation on the color. So on the white jerseys, there's a kind of a baby blue tie-dye looking thing going on. On the on the sleeve uh-huh. cuff, and then on the on the other yeah. one, on the navy blue one, it's a uh, I don't know tan and white sort of like camouflage thing going on. I can't you can't really yeah. see it for what it is, but it it looks like camouflage. And then they've got the muted American flags on the left sleeve. I think I think that's a nice touch because it keeps it uniform, but it's not too loud. Um, and then the yeah. team's three letter acronym is. Uh, is going to be used on the breast, the left breast. That's what it was. I was thinking those were numbers off the top of my head, but now I'm looking at it again. Yeah, it's the, it's the the three letter act. Yeah, and then the there. team's logo. And I th- I yeah. think it's cool with the yeah. logo on top. Yep, it's not bad. It'll be fun yeah, to it see it in person, good. you know, live. And I'm interested to see what that looks like. But 
ultimately, I'm not upset. I think they're stepping in the right direction. So, Brad, do you think this was a Nike decision or was this an MLB decision? Is the PA getting involved or where do you think this came from? I think it was a Nike mm-hmm. decision um, because I think they understand value of seeing something on the field being used <clears throat> rather than just having it be used for the home run derby. I really think they understand the yeah. value in that. And I'm curious. So so here's the thing. I'm going to go back to the NBA yeah. here for just a second. So the NBA, probably seven or eight years ago, introduced a new type of jersey, uh, like a new material, new style. It was lighter weight, and, and it yeah. breathed more. They introduced it in the All-Star game. Three, maybe three or so years later, that was the new standard. Right. Ooh. Ooh. This is the new standard in-game. So I'm curious if baseball is going to step away from the 1800s with the full button down jersey, which don't get me wrong, I like it. It was one, it was one of my favorite things is when I got to high school, we finally had full button down jerseys and I loved it. It was super cool and it was fun. But I'm wondering if Nike is working with Major League Baseball to kind of modernize the baseball jersey, make it lighter weight, a little bit more functional because you see guys who have their shirts unbuttoned halfway because the sh- the shirt just like the jersey just isn't super conducive to moving around especially mm, pitching yeah. right and so i wonder if this is more of a cottony more lightweight jersey that's going to be better for for pitching and throwing and, hit and mm. swinging a bat interesting interesting the purest in me like is thrown up in my mouth a little bit but the rest of me <laughs> <laughs> the modernist the modernist is like yeah that's pretty cool man i don't know yeah and that's the thing is like i said i love the button down because it's unique it to baseball but at the same time it's like it, it's 2021 maybe let's think about something beyond what was used in the hey, civil war but, era but but you know but <laughs> That is what makes baseball baseball. I mean, <laughs> that aesthetic, that feel, everything about it. I don't know. We, you, this is so interesting to me because last week we were heralding the throwback jerseys from the Negro Leagues for, for Juneteenth. Oh, I know. And now you're like, yeah, but I just think that's interesting. Yeah, I know. And the and and those jerseys still are like, if you're going to stick with the button the down, ever. go that yeah, direction. He, yes, but if you're going to modernize it, I see nothing wrong with two buttons. No, at the and top. I agree with you. Just like in the 80s when they had the V-neck, right? It was the same idea yeah. and they yeah. were terrific, but I wonder what, like what it what yep. was it that got them away from that? I don't know. Um yeah, I don't know. And and who who knows, maybe they will go this direction for a little while and then players will be like, "Yeah, no, I I kind of pre- still prefer the uh yeah. the button up." Yeah, I can see you that. Know? I think that's pretty cool. I don't know. So, huh. I don't know. Yeah. Something to keep an eye on. But I'm glad sure. they're not mismatching anymore. The end. <laughs> yes. Exactly. All right. Let's talk D-backs okay. just for a minute. Because this was yeah. insane to me. I mean, this is like all-time losing record here. Lost 24 games on the road. 17 games, which is not like that's not all-time. But they lost 17 games in a row. Finally beat the Brewers. Went on to lose some more games. But 24 games in a row on the road. Finally beat the one of the best teams in baseball beat the Padres ten to one right. in San Diego. Um, I mean, there, I, honestly, like I don't have a whole lot to say about it. It's just it's it it's yeah. noteworthy that somebody in Major League Baseball is this bad this year. And I, I didn't think it was going to be the D backs. No, we both had the D backs doing really well. Well, I, so I had them fitting, like finishing in the middle of the pack in the NL West, maybe yeah. around five hundred, but Never not this bad. bad. I think I had them doing much better than this, but anyway, it's yeah. shocking. It's shocking. I don't know. It is shocking. It, it's absolutely insane. Um, on the on the one hand, it's kind of a nice thing because hey, man, ticket prices for me are going to be pretty low going to the end of the yeah. season. I think. Yeah, you right. <laughs> <laughs> Walk up to the gate. Can I get tickets? Yeah. yeah where do you want to sit? What's available? Please. Anywhere you want. You want you Can we give sit you next tickets? To the organist? Yes, please. He's in left field. He's right there. In fact, yes, oh, I exactly. see you have kids with you. By the way, he sits right beside the children's park, dude. You got to do this. You got to do this. He does. Wilson. So Wilson, I said last week that he that he missed Bowers' uh, yeah. sword sheathing yeah. in the sixth inning because he's playing in the playground, and then he went over and he oh, met the organist sweet. after that. 
who's literally so, right there on the so, concourse. Yeah, he, he thought it's that was fantastic. Yeah, he thought yeah. that was super cool. So, yeah, it's awesome. No, I love awesome. it. I love awesome. it entirely. But we got more yeah. bad news. Uh, this is for the Braves. Mike Soroka, who who tore his Achilles early in the season, uh, has actually retorn his yeah. Achilles. Uh, it's on his right foot, which he's he's a right hander, so it's his it's his push off foot uh, when he pitches. Um, this is gonna be like something that he I think he's gonna have to deal with for a while. I think that his his return is gonna be yeah, pushed way back. Um, yeah, it, it's it's gonna take him a long time. Uh, we're not gonna we're obviously not gonna see him this season. I'm curious if it'll be a considerable amount of time into next season, even because the report that I like I skimmed. I'll be honest with you. One part of it said that his body was rejecting the stitches, and if that's an issue that go that he has going forward, it's going to be a long, yeah. slow recovery. Poor guy, dang. Yeah, it's it really is unfortunate. He's a guy who I I enjoy watching. I enjoy I watching too. the Braves. Yeah, um, just, it goes back to my childhood, and, and for you, I understand. You know, you've got your neighbors are Braves fans. You live in Braves country, so I'm sure it's more yep. enjoyable for you to watch. Absolutely, but that's yeah, it. it's a bummer. It is a bummer. You, you hate to see. A guy of his caliber, especially, really, really struggling with his recovery. Because who knows if he'll be able to get back to what he was? Because that that push off foot could be in the back of his mind well, all the time. I don't, and you can't blame him. I deal with my own injuries. I'm obviously not an elite elite athlete or anything, but you know, I deal with my own injuries, and I walk into the gym every day wondering, you know, and I just and I can do whatever I want. There's no pressure. There's no stakes. There, nobody's watching. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And I walk in every day like, wow, is this going to be the day I mess it up again or what? You know, I don't know. Let's be careful. Yeah. So I can't imagine with all the pressure and all the everything I just said, you know, like, ah, that's got to be so terrible. <laughs> it's got to be so bad. Yeah. My heart goes out to him and everybody else, too. Yeah. Everybody. There's tons of people on the IL yeah. all the time. Tons of people in and out of injuries and whatever, and they still show up. They come back and they whether they force themselves through grit or if it's a true recovery, whatever, it doesn't matter where you will fall on the spectrum. You gotta tip your hat. You have to. It's true. And and you know, this is the scary thing about sports too, is that he was fine. You know, it's one of those things where yeah. he's literally fine until he's not. And this is the and this is the issue that that professional athletes have across all sports. And this is why I don't fault any of these guys for holding out for more money, requesting more money and, no. and pushing the envelope with negotiations with, with ball clubs, because it's like, I got to make as much money as I can. That's right. As soon as possible, because it could all end. I mean, who knows if Soroka, if this is going to be an issue going forward and, and I don't want to say it, like I hate to see it, but sometimes an Achilles is the end I of mean, a career. It's it's become a stereotypical you know? phrase, turn of phrase anyway, right? The Achilles heel, like it's it is, it's literally yeah, a huge exactly. deal. And I mean, we have to. Josh yeah. Naylor is another great example in Cleveland, right? Like that poor guy. Uh-huh. I don't. He he might never be the same. Yeah. Well, so we were talking earlier. I I was telling Brig about how my dad broke his ankle when I was in high school. That's the injury oh, my dad had. Seriously, that same one. Oh. Yeah, that same one, and uh, and the thing and baseball family. I think I was telling Brig about was that I, I mean, it's been seventeen, eighteen years since that happened. Yeah. He still walks with a limp. And granted, my dad was not an, it was never an elite athlete. He didn't have world class. Well, I mean, he he was working with the Blazers, the Trailblazers uh, surgeon wow. on his ankle. So he had a world class surgeon working on his foot and or working on his ankle, and it, yeah. it never healed up right. So I really hope that's not the case with Naylor. I hope he can yeah. he can make it back. You know, by next season, that that's that's a reality. But at the same time, it could be always in the back of his mind, and it could just kind of be one of those lingering nagging. For those of you for baseball family that don't know what we're talking about, uh, there was a collision in the outfield on a check swing of all things, and uh, yeah. the outfield was it the second baseman. I think it was the second baseman. The outfielder collided for a fly ball, yeah. and Naylor goes flying through the air. Lands on his lead leg. I think it was his right leg, and yeah, his twists right leg. over backward, yep. and the foot stayed where it was. And it was, it was what? Well, do you remember the first time you saw um, Joe Theismann's leg break? It's like that. Oh yeah. Right? When when Oof. Lawrence Taylor hit him, and you're yeah. like, holy crap! It was that's how it looks, and it's just awful. So 
anyway, that's what's that's what we're talking about. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So so Brig sent me the clip on Instagram, and I I text back. I said, and that's why right. I was never First, a physical or therapist, a field or trainer, or sports trainer. trainer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, trainer, because uh, I could not be. deal with that. You wanted to be. <laughs> I would have been. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be, and then I saw yeah. something like that. I was the like, no, nope, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get into drugs instead. Uh, put, the, put an end to it real fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna right. to deal drugs instead. Yep. Of you that Absolutely. Know, Brad worked in the pharmacy for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i did all right okay let's yeah. talk about the giants real quick and then uh, let's wrap it up and get into our uh our cubs our cubs or mount rushmore yeah mount rushmore whatever that thing's called okay giants are like the best team in baseball man, right they? now <laughs> who saw not that me. coming not me no way sheesh I- I had them honestly finishing yeah, four, like towards five, the bottom four, of the five, NL West, something like that for sure. Uh, yeah, above the Rockies, yeah, four right. is yes. what I was thinking. They've won ten of twelve and scored eighty three runs during that period. Holy moly! Has Buster Posey found like the no, fountain seriously. of youth or something? It's like who, who is this? <laughs> he's, not, he's not that old, uh, but he's exactly. a catcher. I mean, well, come but on. he's been around forever, and you you think Buster Posey, and you might as well think like I don't know, I don't know that what. Yachty? You think, I mean, That's exactly you think right. Yachty Molina, you think Yachty right? Yachty Molina. Yachty Molina's been around a friggin' billion years. It's like Miguel Cabrera. It's the same thing. And You're so like, Buster, what? He's still, damn, he's still going. Yeah. <laughs> but Buster Posey is younger than both those guys, though. He's wow. only 34. Seriously? He's only 34? Yeah, it's, it's, that he, it's that he just burned through the minor wow. leagues. And, and the Giants were like, he is the chosen sure. one. And we will build our future around him, and they have, yeah. and they've done very well doing it because Miggy's thirty eight, yeah, and I think Yachty's thirty nine. Yeah. So wait, how many years has he been in the league? If he's thirty four, um, I'm turning thirty four. Right, here. he's uh, twelve <laughs> years. So he, this is his twelfth season. Right. He didn't play yeah, last he opted year. Out. Um, yeah, his first season he oh. was twenty two. He he came up as a as a September call up at, at age twenty two, two thousand ten at age twenty three. That play was that his year? first season, first full like, season. In yeah, the, like in two thousand ten. Forty. Oh, seriously? <laughs> so no yeah. no issues there calling it his rookie year. Huh. Yeah, no, not even close. Yeah, he, he definitely he definitely exceeded his rookie limits then. And then two thousand eleven was when he had that that. Another, yeah. Speaking of another broken leg, you know we got the Buster Posey rule now. He played forty five games because he, right. he broke his leg in a collision at home plate. But he doesn't seem to have had any issues since then because he wasn't even an all star until the next season. No, no big deal. Just until the next season, he recovered and he got back on the field, and then boom, he's an all star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and I will say this: like as a catcher, I think it was beneficial for him to have taken last year off. He opted out of the season yeah, because his, right. he and his wife just had twins, right? Yeah, so he so he had a, a year off on his knees, and now he's come back. I mean, he he's got to be an all star, and not just because the they have to having. pick somebody from every team. He's, right, but he's batting three twenty six. He's batting three. Nobody's batting three twenty six right now. Twelve home runs, twenty seven <sighs> RBIs. Man, we should do yeah. an analysis on catchers. Let's like let's figure out who the freak we should. The I'd be down are for that. that that are impressive because that that blows my mind a little bit and it shouldn't but you know San Francisco's just hanging out there being the dark horse being quiet. Well, and you know it, it's crazy though because he, I mean he was one of like the first this this first one of the first guys in this wave of offensive yeah, catches, yeah. right? Like he and Yachty. And now you know you've got you've got Gary Sanchez who is yeah. an offensive first catcher. Um, JT Real Muto is equally yep. great on both well sides. Well balanced, you know. Um, Yasmani Grandal is very good. I mean, he did cost the yeah. Dodgers a World Series. What about I'll say that, Wilson Contreras? That was defensively. Wilson Contreras is outstanding. Exactly. He's a converted catcher. He was an infielder. Got com- he, he he turned over to uh, to be a catcher in in the minor leagues. Got called up. And he's been a catcher ever since, didn't and he's Denise, outstanding on both didn't sides. Didn't Denise post the thing the saying he's got 25 throwouts since 2016? The next closest guy is 12. 
Yeah, and I think the next, and I think yeah, the next guy has like just over ten. <laughs> Man. Yeah, Man. something like that. Yeah. Yeah, we should do a catcher episode. Maybe we'll start yeah, doing. That's a pretty uh, cool positions. idea. Let's do it. Okay, last Deal. question. I'll I got to ask you this calendar. last question. Do you think that the home run derby in Denver is going to be the most exciting one we ever see? Um, I don't know if it'll even be as exciting as the last one we had in Colorado. Mm, okay. To be honest. I have a theory as to... Let me, um, let me make sure. You go ahead and tell me, but I, I, yeah, I think I have an idea why you might feel that way. Okay. So here's the thing. Is it's the home run derby is getting to be like the slam dunk contest in the NBA. Right. The big names don't want to do it anymore. Like, yes, Trevor Story for the Rockies said that he's Shohei gonna Otani, do it. big deal. It it is a big deal. Shohei Otani, big deal, yeah. But I want I wanna see Fernando Tatis up there hitting home Me runs. Too. I wanna see Vlad Guerrero up there hitting home runs. Those guys hit some of the yeah. deepest bombs in the league, and I would love to see them just take BP for a night. Yep. And try to hit it out. I want to see somebody hit a ball out of Coors Field, and oh, I think one Vlad of those could two do could it. do it. Are you kidding me? He could. Yeah. He no, sure I really could. think he could. I think yeah. I think Tatis could too. <laughs> Either Not of those guys Otani's is capable not. of it. Otani could. And well, the problem is Otani's a lefty. I don't think he's going to hit a ball no. out in right yeah. field. You know. <laughs> It, it <laughs> that really grandstand's is. pretty high up in right field, but left field where it's where it's a little bit the lower scoreboard. doesn't go all the way yeah. up to that, that third deck. You know they could hit for one sure. Over, they could hit it over the scoreboard. That scoreboard's pretty cool. But okay, all right. Give me your theory. Well, I was just I was Give about to theory. say the same thing. I think that that if we had the right players competing, it would be the most exciting one ever. But I everybody's gun shy, and with the season going the way it's going, and everybody being a little bit hesitant about messing up their swing or not getting you know not getting some days off, I would take it off. I would honestly. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. I get it. Tatis yeah. said that he's not doing it because of his shoulder. You know, he had that shoulder injury early, early injury earlier in the season. Um, I don't blame him. That's a lot of violent swings up there. I wouldn't do I it would, if I had. I don't think I do it at all. And Aaron so, Judge keeps getting invited, and he's like, no, because his rookie year it threw him way off. I, I think that was one of the pivotal moments for most Major League Baseball players. They're watching Aaron Judge. He hit home run after home run, and obviously he broke the Major League record for rookies that year. But soon to be eclipsed uh-huh. right not very long later because he didn't go past 52 because after the home run derby everything fell apart he changed his swing for the derby yeah and and you know here so pete alonso's coming great. back to defend his title because he won the rookie in it. home run title too and and i don't i don't think it had any effect i don't think it affected him at all and you know who else who else it hasn't affected yeah, is acuna true. ronald acuna i don't think was Harper? affected by it Um, Bryce Harper, I think, is a victim of playing 110 percent. He single plays 100 percent, 110 percent, walking up the stairs. I think, I think you're right. Yeah. He's just got that level of intensity, and I think that. All right. So okay, okay. Here's another thing, yeah. real quick before we before we wrap up here. Um, another NBA thing. I talked a lot of NBA. <laughs> I know, I know. Even, but <laughs> so one thing. One thing that they that I've heard people talk a lot about it with uh, why they don't like kids coming yeah. straight out of high school to call, to the NBA is because of the schedule. That an 18 year old shouldn't go from playing 30 games in a season mm. to 82, because your body's not ready for that. You know, you, you got to have a year in college to play 40, 45, whatever it is that they play, to work your way up to 82. Um, and I feel like. Some of these guys who zip through the minors, Bryce Harper was drafted and went through the minors like yeah. 17. He made his debut at 19. 162 games at the age at age 19 is a lot. And granted, I know some kids who play travel ball, they, they might, might play 180. You know, if their coach is able to schedule those games for them, they might play as many as 180, 200 games in a year, but right. not at the major league level. And so I wonder if. So many games so early for Bryce Harper mm. on like such a young body. Uh, 
has is starting to take its toll, and I and I feel like maybe we see that with more guys as they start to yeah. age earlier. You know, like don't get me wrong, yeah, Bryce oh, Harper's still a really good player. Yeah, yeah, no, very, totally. very good, terrific ball, ball player. But, but I think I think we're going to see an earlier decline with him because he came up so early, and I think that we see that with some guys. Yeah, I like so, it. That's just a theory I have. I don't no, have I like a it. whole lot to back it up. But anyway, all right. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to talk about our Chicago Cubs, Mount Rushmore. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I never get back with me root. Root, root for the home to stay. Don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Shop kids' baseball shirts at 9plusss.com. Welcome back, baseball family. Brad and I are going to get into the Chicago Cubs Mount Rushmore. Now, again, we have a storied franchise, lots of history, lots of heartbreak in this history. So much. Everybody knows. But I'll tell you what, there have been some incredible personalities. And as we have said in the past, you cannot tell the Cubs story without these names. That's how we feel. Mm. That's how we present this information. And I am very interested to know where we overlap. We have almost killed Brad <laughs> at least one time <laughs> Yeah. in the amount of uh-huh. overlap that we've experienced. <laughs> so if you didn't listen to the L.A. Dodgers Mount Rushmore episode yet, you've got to. Watching it might be even better. Oh, I was going to say that would be the best experience. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, so get after it. <laughs> um, Brad, let, let me uh, preview the Chicago Cubs for us really quick. Uh, they've been around for 146 seasons total. That's 1976 or 1876, excuse me, all the way to 2021, and we're still rolling. Their record win loss is 514 total. We've got 11,020 victories, in contrast to 10,433 failures or losses i guess is probably the most appropriate <laughs> not every loss is a failure break yeah okay thanks okay. brad you're yeah. right okay all right don't lead off so far next time no <laughs> 21 playoff appearances 17 pennants we have three count them three world championships seven players have their numbers retired and that includes jackie robinson always so there we go. Yep, for sure. Uh, Brad, I would like to know who, in no particular order, do you have as one of the names on your list? Okay. Um, so we've actually been here before. It feels like this is something we've done because I've talked about this before okay. along this line. I'm going to start with Cap Anson. Cap Anson. Really? Really. Uh, you wouldn't happen to mean... Uh... Cap. Where's his full name? Adrian... Adrian Constantine Anson, would you? That's the guy. <laughs> That's the guy. He's on my list as well, sir. Of course he is. Yes, Why of wouldn't he be? <laughs> so this is a big deal to me. Okay? <laughs> okay. I have right here on Baseball Reference, I have that he was the best player in 18... <laughs> this is going back. We're going all it. the way. We're digging hard here. 1800s here, people. 1888, 1889 for the Chicago White Stockings. Now, this is not the American League Chicago White Sox. This is not a predecessor. Right. This is still the National League Chicago Cubs, but were originally known as the White Stockings, then the right. Orphans, then the Cubs. Actually, the Colts Orphans Colts, Cubs. Colts Orphans Cubs, yeah. That's right. But yeah, this is the Chicago White Stockings, 1888, 1889. Best player on the team, also the manager. Bingo! Player manager. Player and, manager. okay, break. That was 88-89. Uh-huh. Let's go back to 1881. I'm ready. The very same. <laughs> Best player, <laughs> manager. Yeah. Player manager on the team. That's... Yeah. Unreal to me. Yeah. It's like, I, do, I don't, I can't comprehend it. I've said this before that I've coached before, I've played, I can't imagine doing both. Right. You know, it, it's, it's unreal. So, Cap Anson also, 
So he became the manager in 1879, finished his man- managerial career in 1897. Yeah. When, you know what he did in 1897 as well? Well. He also retired. Yeah. So he was a player manager <laughs> for most of his career. He was. It's not the entire time. Like, let's see, 18, started in 1871. Now that I'm looking at the years, I'm like, yeah, I yeah. think he was pretty much, Yeah. 22 seasons with the Cubs. Yeah. With what yeah. we now know as the Cubs. And he, he became the manager in... Sorry, I had that up and I'm just like so all over the place right now. But <laughs> 1879? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that's nearly all of his career. It really is. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. But he's the winningest manager in Cubs history. Yes. In French, I should say franchise history. Because like right. I said, he's White Stockings. That's right. Um, But he also... Uh, he's a Hall of Famer. Four-time batting title. This is dead ball era, so we're not going to get into, you know, obviously there's not going to be all the awards, like Tons. All-Star, yeah. Gold Glove, stuff like that. But the fact that he won a batting title mm-hmm. during the dead ball era, and he is in the Hall of Fame. He is. That goes a long way for those guys because he is pre-Hall of Fame anyway. Right. So he was brought in in a Veterans Committee mm-hmm. Culture Club yes, culture nomination. Club. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But he had a 94.3 war. Yep. He hit 334 lifetime average. That is impressive. It's impressive. For that long to be sustainable. 22 at least. Yeah. Yep. So I, I like Cap Hanson. This is, he's an excellent, excellent piece to our Mount Rushmore. I agree. He's my statistical anomaly pick. He's mm. my stat leader pick. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, I have a little bit of a system that I use to put together my Mount Rushmore's. Brad but does not. And that's no, very exciting. there is no system. <laughs> there is no order. <laughs> but but Cap Anson's my statistical leader, and I'm telling you that over 22 years with just the Cubs franchise, it gets better. Mm-hmm. More statistics. You oh, ready? Sweet. Let's do it. He, it, considering runs scored, he has 1,999 runs scored. I'd have played one more day. I know, right? Let's see if I get that one more. Seriously, <laughs> that puts him at ninth all time in Major League Baseball. Ninth. Then we're talking hits. 3,435 hits. Number seven all time. Now, this dude hasn't played in over 100 years. Yeah. And he's still in the number seven slot. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the best one. He's a first baseman. Mm-hmm. He played a couple of positions, but as a first baseman only, if you only look at his first base numbers, he is responsible for 21,699 putouts. That means that he recorded the out in the in the play. That puts him at number 2 all time. And you know, you were you were telling me these numbers before right. and I was trying to figure out who it was like, "My gosh, that's a that's an outstanding. That's a huge number." Yeah. Crazy for somebody to be second. Um, but, you know, it makes perfect sense being in the dead ball era. Yeah. A lot of balls in the infield. Lots. A lot of balls a lot of in ground the infield. Balls. And even, yeah. I'm sure at that point, there were balls in the outfield. I'm sure the outfielders were playing very shallow because of, of the dead ball. Yeah. It wasn't uncommon, I'm, I'm sure, for a ball, to, a ground ball to go to right field and the guy to get out. Totally. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You hard hit ball to the right fielder, he's, he's out. So it makes perfect sense. I'm sure there's a lot of 9 3. Whole lot of four three. Oh, <laughs> you know? Some nine three that would be pretty cool though. Like, yeah, it doesn't happen very often. Not now. especially not anymore. Yeah, the guys are faster. The balls are head other but anyway. Totally. Lots lots of details. Well, yeah. they didn't even have a mound back then. It was just a circle. Yeah. So <laughs> for yeah. most most of the time, it's yeah. Diff- it almost it's a completely different game. It is. It, well, but, no, it's not completely different, but there are some nuances that make it that change it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Yeah. That's we agree on number one. Brad, why don't you go ahead with your next one? Okay. I have. This is a player who I was first introduced to as a. How those? I was four when I got my first glove. My uncle gave me my first glove, and it was. You know how when you're little, you had like the signature in the palm uh-huh. of your glove. Of course. So this player's signature was in the palm of my glove that I actually had for a very long time. Used it way longer than I probably should have, because the <laughs> glove that I used primarily as I got a little bit older was a catcher's glove. So I just had this in my bag just because I had it. Um, I think I was 13 when I replaced it. Okay, so he's not a catcher. Not a catcher. Okay. No. Okay. This is Brian Sandberg. Brian Sandberg. Yeah. Oh, good so, choice. So he is a Hall of Famer. Yeah. He won an MVP award, 10-time All-Star, 9-time Gold Glove winner, 7-time Silver, Silver Slugger, oh. and Major League Player of the Year. So he he got his first All-Star. He was voted to his first All-Star game in 1984, and then he had a run where he was voted an All-Star every year until 1993. Wow. So that is that's a consistent like that's like a ten year peak. 
Right? It's huge. That's it's really strong. It's really that, during that period of time in 84, he won an MVP. Yeah. Um, he won gold glove every year except for uh, except for 92, and then you didn't get one in 93 either. But you know, you, you start to see as a second baseman, you start to see that fall off a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that's perfectly normal. But then he didn't play in '95 because of uh, looks. I'm assuming injury. Yeah. But then he went ninety six, ninety seven, finished off his career really strong. I mean, he hit two forty four, two sixty four, and that's natural for a thirty six, thirty seven year old naturally aging baseball player. I feel like that's something Thank that, you. Thank that you. I have to put on there a lot. It's very good because no. having grown up in the nineties. You have a certain expectation for guys 36, 37, 38 years old. That's right. But when you see guys who are naturally aging, that's what happens. It falls off. And this is the appropriate response. Yeah. Yes. That's the way it should be. How long be. was he with the club? So he was with the club for 16 years. Oh, uh, sorry. 15. He, he started, his first year was, uh, he played 13 games with the Phillies, if I could spit that out. Um, and then and then he was, I'm assuming, traded to the Cubs. To the Cubs, yeah. In 82. And, and the rest is history. Yeah, no kidding. Like I said, thirteen games. I'm assuming that's a September call up in yeah. in eighty one, and then I mean that that's opening day roster right there. Yeah, in eighty two. Yeah, so so great player. You like I said, you can't tell the story of the Cubs without Ryan Sandberg. Um, I agree. He's he's a big deal. He was my honorable mention. Oh look at that! Yeah, very nice. Nice, good pick. I'll allow it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, break. Who you got next? Can you handle it? Maybe. Yeah, you probably can. <laughs> <laughs> my number two, the next pick on my list, also a Hall of Famer. Okay. Okay. I feel like that's a thing that happens. Uh-oh. Hall of Famer, 14-time All-Star. Eight of those were consecutive seasons. Two-time MVP. Twice. Twice. Twice, time. which you've previously stated is kind of one of your things. It's a big deal. Yeah. So, two-time MVP, baseball family. Also has a gold glove. Career war, 67.7. Batting average career, 274. Okay. Playing first base and shortstop. We're talking about Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks. Yes, sir. Now, he played with the Cubs for 19 years. I feel like this should go more highlighted. (laughs) And we do that regularly. But I feel like the larger baseball congregation ooh that's that's what we'll call it that's a good word. the larger baseball congregation i think doesn't recognize 19 20 year careers for what they are think about it 20 years is an entire generation and yes. this guy represented a full generation of baseball fans in chicago he played from his age 22 year to his age 40 year. Let's put that in perspective a little bit. Like you said, 20 years, that's a generation. You're it right. is. You're it's right. a whole generation. There are kids who were born in 53 yeah. and then saw him in 71. Like, you're an adult. Well, right? think about the think about the 13-year-old, the 10, 12, 13-year-old in 53. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who, you know, is now old. Yes. <laughs> they're no, their, they're our age. They're 30s. Yeah, that's that's legitimate. But here's the other thing, too. Is you know I, I feel like as fans we take it for granted how how often guys last that long at the big league level because I haven't talked about it for a while but I used to listen to David Samson's every, daily podcast yeah, every right. day and one of the things he would tell the players when they would call him up they said okay the hardest thing you've done to this point in your career is make it to the show make it all the way through the minor leagues make it to the show yeah the absolute hardest thing that you will find in your career is staying here. That's something that doesn't go credited ever, right. I feel like. Because yeah, there right. are guys who, like they say, have a cup of coffee in the show. That's get up all for the September call-ups, come up because of an injury replacement. You know, yes. they're up and down. They're kind of in the cooler. And now they call it the taxi squad. Yeah. You know, they're kind of up and down in between who get a taste of it, but they never make it. Crash Davis was the best 26 days I ever, I ever had. Yeah. And he never got back. Yeah, There exactly. are guys who get a taste but never, ever get back. To have 20 years in the show... Uh, and we see a lot of guys, like I said, we take it for granted because we see a lot of guys who are the everyday players yeah. who we know, we love, but they could just as easily be somebody who has a two-year peak yeah. ends up back in the minors. Yeah, that's right. Well, talk about an everyday player. Ernie Banks, I think what I'm looking at six times out of his 20 or his 19-year career, led the entire league in games played. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and that's, that's a legitimately everyday player. 154, 154, 156, 154, 155, 156. Mm-hmm. It's insane. Yeah, and he only fell below 150 just a few times. It's really only a couple. You know, he actually has 163 games played in 1965. Yeah. You know, that's that one game playoff that is just fantastic. Yep. It's not really a thing anymore, but... But it happened. It, it happened, and it does happen from time to time. Well, and yeah. what's cool is after 62, when he goes on that eight-game stretch where he's uh, an all-star, or excuse me, eight-season stretch where he's an all-star every year, mm-hmm. he's no longer an all-star 63-64 than he is in 65, then not 66, then he is again in 67, then not in 68, but then again in 69. He's 38 years old by then, still making the all-star team. Mm-hmm. Even though it's a little intermittent, the, I mean, the guy is still a baller. Well, he's so consistent because just because he doesn't make the All Star team those four years doesn't mean he had bad years. No, he batted four sixteen that year. Huh. He was no, thirty eight. Oh, sorry, three oh nine. I was like, Whoops. no, he didn't bat four sixteen. Sorry, slugs. <laughs> he's slugging four sixteen. Oh, I'm sorry. His on base, his OBP <laughs> was three oh nine. He hit, there it goes. Hit two fifty three, which <laughs> is not outstanding, but he wasn't an average. He didn't hit for average. Yeah. He's a home run hitter. He is. In 58, he led the league with 47. Right. In 60, he led the league with 41. Yeah. So he there was you. doing Thank his you. job. Thank he was you. supposed yeah, to do. Appreciate so. that. Yeah. There you go. But anyway. Getting cross-eyed. <laughs> Baseball family, we're going to take a break. <laughs> and then when we come back, we're going to give our number three and number four picks respectively uh, in no particular order. I'm Jason. And I'm David. And we're the hosts of the non North Sports Podcast. We're the home of sports talk for everyone. Join us bi-weekly as we talk about the happenings in sports. You can find the non Other Sports Podcast on Anchor.fm, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever else you find your podcasts. No matter which ballpark you're at, you want to rep your team. Now you can with 9 Plus Us. Welcome to the Big City Series. With every design available in your team's colors, you can fit in with the home crowd, or stand out on the road. Either way, we have the colors you crave. Shop the Big City Series and find designs that rep your favorite baseball podcast, cheer from the cheap seats, and much more. Shop the Big City Series only at 9plusus.com. Welcome back, baseball family. Here we are. We're going to do the rest of our our Chicago Cubs Mount Rushmore. Uh, We've done... the. The first two, the first one we overlapped on Cap Anson from the 1800s. Yeah, that was that was fun. It's irrefutable and, though. And he, you know, we talked when we was it the uh, was it the Braves? We talked about great mustaches in baseball. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, he falls in that category for it's sure. Nice, it's kind of a thin mustache, a little bit feathery, but I think he would fall into that category. Not necessarily on the Mount Rushmore of great mustaches in baseball, but no. he would be Cubs though. Yeah, yeah Cubs maybe, great maybe, mustache. Yeah. yeah, maybe we'll. Do that when we finish these is we'll do uh, team mustache from Mount Rushmore. We are. We're doing those. <laughs> if we have not already started, since we're you're now caught in the space time continuum. That's true. <laughs> in the way back. All That's right, Brig. Right. <laughs> okay, go ahead and give me your third Mount Rushmore uh, nominee, as we've discussed before. Yes, sir. My nomination uh, in the third slot is going to be possibly controversial. I picked somebody. From the 2016 World Series team, I felt like that was inevitable. And really, when you break it down, for me, there's really only a couple of names that that can get called up in that situation. I can feel your energy, Brad. Are you like, going to agree with me on this? I'm worried that I'm going to. Because I don't... Uh, because I have somebody from that team as well. Do you really? I do. Because yeah. you're shifty over there. I know. Okay. I don't know what he has put. Unpredictable. You never know what's going to come from this side of the table. I'm telling you, okay, so let me do it. Let me set it up the way okay. I set it up, okay? This guy will always go down as a Cub. I swear if he leaves the Cubs, again, he's a current player. If he leaves the Cubs, I will be so sad. It's going to be terrible. Mm-hmm. He's we're currently sitting. 2021 is his 11th season in the bigs. He had a short stint with another team. I won't give away who. With another team <laughs> in 2011. And now in 2021, he's been with the Cubs for 10 years. 2021. It is, is it the same guy? It yes, is. it is. <laughs> <laughs> Career war right now, 35.5. 35.5. Uh, we're already at a lifetime batting average of 270. He's got 230 home runs. Three-time All-Star, 2016 World Series, four-time Gold Glove Silver Slugger. 
Platinum Glove Award winner and... All around nice guy. All around nice guy. <laughs> clubhouse clown. Dancing naked on top of a table. Read the Cubs way. It's Anthony Rizzo. It is Anthony Rizzo. Yeah. I'm yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was my he was my next guy. And I mean, go ahead because you were the one who started. Go ahead and introduce, and then I'll talk about. Well, I kind of already did. You know, I feel oh, like yeah. this is. I mean, this is just who he is. It's, yeah. So he's the best. He's thirty one. He, Right now, that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal because he's he's so young and he's still playing really good baseball. Great baseball. So this is there's a couple things to go go in with this. First off, um, it's a big deal that he beat cancer and is as great of a player as he is. Totally, you know. And you've got John Lester the same. Yes, you know, those guys. And there's are some, sure. there's a handful of guys that yeah like there are yeah. Um, but he is a fan favorite, big For time, sure. no and doubt. People love Anthony Rizzo. Yes. And I'm sure that he is a big part of the clubhouse that keeps keeps those teams together. Yeah, you know, like you talked about, was it he was he was giving motivational speeches naked, right? Is that naked what it was? motivational speeches? Yeah, he stand up I on the trainer's table. He started a dance party, a naked dance party, yeah. or something yeah. like that at one point as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if that's shocking to anybody, I mean, you just got to understand that major league clubhouses are R rated. Like totally at the very least. Right. Watch Major League. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Like, that or is don't. Ac- I don't know. Or, yeah, yeah, that's an accurate depiction of a major league clubhouse though. Right. That's censored down to R rated. But anywho, no, he you can't tell the story of the two thousand sixteen Cubs without Anthony Rizzo's leadership and role on that team. And you can't tell the story of the Cubs without twenty sixteen. Exactly. So if you pick the one guy from twenty sixteen and you can't have it without twenty sixteen, it's gotta be Rizzo. For sure. That was my exact thought process. Me I, too. As I was going through trying to find somebody, I said, I've got to find somebody from that team because that's a huge deal. It, it's the hugest. The hugest deal. The deal most is hugest. The most is hugest deal is that 2016 team. <laughs> and so then I went through the list. I was like, okay, who's it going to be? I was like, I love Javi Baez. Totally. Absolutely fantastic. No, um, for real. My initial thought, honestly, was David Ross. Me too. Are oh you serious? <laughs> yes. Okay, but why yeah. did you discount him? Because I had the same. I had reasons. Because he didn't. A, he didn't play for the Cubs long enough. Two seasons. Yes. That's, that's why. That's not long. That's enough. why. Yeah, but and then the fact that he stuck around and he's the manager. manager. If he wins another World Series as a manager. Totally different he's situation. On. Yeah. Yeah. Like, now it, he's in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's not necessarily on, but he's definitely in the conversation yes. for sure. Yes. Agree with you one hundred percent on that, but. Also, so and then I went through. I was like, Chris Bryant. He was like the guy. Yeah. That was like we're bringing him up, and we're gonna win the World Series. With yes. Him. You know, he was yeah. he was the golden child that was propped up on the pedestal. Yep. By the franchise. Yep. But and he's, he's gonna leave. He's gonna get traded. He's leaving. Yeah. Yes. He's gonna be gone. That's why he can't be on there. That not only that, but he did not have the leadership role no. that Rizzo had. No. But, but I'll tell you what, that David Ross home run. That's a big deal. Oh man, yeah. at yeah. forty years old! Yeah. Oh my god! After yeah. a rain delay, no. Ever, and he came in to substitute. Yeah. Oh my yeah. word! Coming off the bench, legitimately he, one of the best didn't stories in baseball. Ball. Didn't he have a pass ball too? And he went, went up and was like really trying to make up for yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Hit that home run. Yeah. Oh no, I, man, I really considered David Ross because of his role on that team Same. and his current role with the Cubs. Yep. But it wasn't as impactful as Anthony Rizzo. That's right. So. I agree with you. No, that's amazing, dude. That's awesome. Okay. All right. I don't know if we're going to... That's two for four. I know. And I'm really worried about this last I one. I am too. You might die uh, again. I, yeah. now, I'm going to punch you if it's the same. <laughs> I only smacked you last time. But if you copy me again, I'm going to punch you in the arm. Okay. All right. So get I'll, ready. I'll take it. I got some Tiger Bomb. Ultra. I'll, I'll, I could probably use it. All right. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. <laughs> you're really... You're winding up. I'm ready. Oh, no. Okay. Terry Carey. <laughs> Are you serious? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. I no, got me right there. too. <laughs> yeah, I've got Harry Carey. I can't handle this. Uh, <laughs> this isn't how this is supposed to go. No. <laughs> Baseball family, we legitimately do not reveal. We sat our on picks. the other side of the room while we were figuring. Yeah, these we out. did. We we do not talk about this. This is this is vault stuff. Yes, it's true. Harry Carey. Harry Carey. Um, you can't tell the story that comes about Harry Carey. Uh, no, you can't. And my favorite Harry Carey-ism, like, this, like you okay. get into the whole Will Ferrell thing. You, you know, have to, because a little bit. The SNL thing is so funny, but yes. the thing that, that Will Ferrell didn't do 
as Harry Carey that the first time I saw that sketch I was waiting for was the Harry Carey. That ball is foul. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I waited all the time watching WGN waiting for Harry Carey. That ball is foul. Oh. Yeah. I loved it. It's, <laughs> it's an underrated part of his, his calling a game, and I loved it every little bit. I can't believe we tied it up again. That is <laughs> astonishing. So... <laughs> Again, you have to acknowledge WGN, right? Uh, Everybody could watch the Cubs in the 90s. Everybody yeah. could. Yep. And we were all listening to Harry Carey all the time. Dude, th- this is what kills me, though. I did a little bit of more research, and I did not okay. know a lot about Harry Carey. Okay. I'll admit. Okay, yeah, I, me, me I only knew him as the personality of the Cubs, uh, the voice yeah. of the Cubs. But he was 53 years as a major league announcer. Mm-hmm. 53 years. 25 of them, get ready for this, 25 of them were with the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't either. And that that's crazy that he went within the division, especially with These are rivalries. Those, yeah. This is huge. Yeah. And, but he had an overlay in Oakland, and then he went 11 seasons with the White Sox. And I had no idea about that either. Me neither. Because that was way before I was born. Totally. You know, like, so I wasn't, but no... So he retired from the Cubs when he, in 1997. 16 years with the Cubs. So 90, I'd say probably 90 to 97 mm-hmm. were the my peak years of sitting down in an afternoon because the Cubs were playing day games every day, day at that games. point. That's right. And I was All probably 92 to 97. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I'd sit down and watch a baseball game just a little kid. You totally. Know, I was born in 86, so just little, little. Yeah, I was 87. Yeah. And... Uh, and that distinct voice, I just thought he was the voice of baseball. Me too. Harry Carey was the voice of baseball to me. And I just thought that he was the guy who called every game. Yep. You know, until probably 94, 95. You know, so there's a few years there. But, but yeah, that was... That's what Harry baseball Curry, sounded like. Yeah, Harry That's Curry what was baseball, baseball sounded like. The, yeah. the, very distinct vo- the very distinct voice, the foul, foul ball call, you know, totally. Cubs win... All of it was was baseball. Time. Well, and again, you have to have the conversation about Vince Scully, Harry Carey. Uh-huh. The, these are the the two of them. They're the sound of baseball. This is what baseball sounds like. But the killer thing about them is that they were not afraid to get excited on the air, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, that's the best part. Harry Carey was not afraid to be a homer. Yeah, what we call a homer now, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And he was as excited as the everyday fan. He was a, so was Vince Scully, but Harry Carey was excited as the everyday fan. He, I felt like he genuinely represented my emotional experience, mm-hmm. but he got to do it publicly. Yeah, the only person listening to me was me. Right, <laughs> everybody else was having the same experience. And the only person who cared was you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, yes, <laughs> but Harry Carey was representing this collective idea, this collective opinion, this these emotional responses. He got to bring out, and and it was the same thought we were all having. Mm-hmm. I loved yeah. it. And he did it in such a an inviting way. He could have been the neighbor down the street that was just yelling at the top of his lungs, Cubs win, Cubs win, Cubs win. Mm-hmm. It's the best. Yeah. Harry well, Carey. And the tradition that carries on after him, no pun intended, of him of him singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Yeah. You know, the Cubs bringing in a new person every day to sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Right. Is great. It's great. It's a strong tradition, and it's something that I feel like every team should do. We don't. We don't need God Bless America anymore. It's fine. There's nothing it, wrong fine. with God Bless America. There's nothing wrong with the song. It's not as good as Take Me Out of the Ball Game. But we sing the national anthem before the game. That's then right. we sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and then we sing God Bless America. Well, sometimes it's God Bless America, and then Take Me Out of the Ball yeah, Game. Yeah, it is. You're right. That is the order, and yeah. then it's cumbersome. And if you want to cut down the game time, this is a whole different thing. Then remove God Bless America. There you then. go. And then get in. Well, unless you're in Boston's organization, you're and that's Sweet Carolina. Sweet Carolina. But don't fifth. they? Don't, that's in the fifth. Oh, that's in the fifth. Okay. Typically, well, but players are is. still warming up, though. Yeah, you, they do right. it in the interim. They do yeah. it between the innings. Yeah, yeah, because players are still warming up. The that's thing right. is, is that totally. during God Bless America, everything stops. Yeah, you're right. And that's that's the it's issue bad. That I have with yeah, it. okay, I can see that. Yeah. I can see why that made that's, it bad. It's been 20 years. They've been doing that for 20 years now. Can you believe that? No, I did not know. That's crazy. That's a long time, and it's, it's almost. Long, I'm worried that it's going to become a tradition forever, hmm. because it made sense in 2001, two, three, and four. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel like it, it doesn't. Make I sense can't believe anymore. it's been that long. It doesn't feel like it's been that it long. It doesn't feel like it's been that long. Wow, no. But, I'll tell you what, baseball family. When uh, Bill Murray got to sing "Take Me Out," <laughs> it was about the best thing ever. 
<laughs> I'll need to look that up. I don't you didn't know about that? I know about it. I don't remember. Ah, it was in 2016. It. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in 2016, we were watching every Cubs game. Right. Because I was laid up. Tiff was laid up. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. So, yeah. We got we got a lot of experience. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And now the Cubs are my national league team. For sure. There you go. Yeah, man. Nothing wrong with that. No. But baseball family, once again, like we always say with the Mount Rushmore episodes, let us know what you think. Yep. Uh, was Cap Anson, does he actually deserve, because he was a dead ball era player. I does mean, he actually deserve to be on the Mount Rushmore? Let us know. Great Submit question. to the mailbag on baseballtogether.com. In the navigation, click or tap, depending if you're on a phone or, or a computer. Yeah. Uh, tap, submit to mailbag. It'll take you directly to it. Just fill out the form. You'll send us a message. Let us know what you think. We want to hear from you on this stuff, baseball family, for sure. For sure. Don't forget to jump on the shop as well at 9plusus.com. It's N-I-N-E-P-L-U-S-U-S.com. I don't know if you can see this handsome devil next to me, <laughs> but Brad, if you're listening, you can't, so I'll describe it for you. Brad, Brad here's Brad wearing a nice black t-shirt. He's wearing his Arizona-themed baseball together t-shirt, as well as our Yagyu hat in one of the Korean uh, leagues. I'm wearing the baseball things cap in cream with a black visor. Very nice. Don't forget the Savages. Savages in the box. That's my t-shirt right here. That is based on something that Aaron Boone said. Was it last year or two years ago? It was two years ago. It was an ultra-specific reference. So if you don't know about that, you should go look it up. Savages in the box. It's a great baseball story. It's it's perfect. It's so funny. Aaron Boone, manager of the New York Yankees, for those of you that might not know that. That's okay. (laughs) It's totally fair. But don't forget, you can stop by BaseballTogether.com. You can watch the podcast. You can listen to the podcast. By now, we should have a lot of stuff up and running on that. Tons. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Because yeah. uh, we're in the process of, of overhauling some stuff, going through some stuff. So you can hop on baseballtogether.com and just poke around a little bit and see what you find. There's going to be some good stuff for you there. And baseball family, we will catch you next week. Mm-hmm.